Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. We're gonna be looking at this MDEC Video 300A monitor today. If you were around and you were using 8-bit computers back in the old days, you probably would have seen this monitor used on people's computers. It was pretty common. I think at the time when this came out, it was before Apple even introduced their own monitor. Although I'm not quite sure about that, and we'll be able to look at the back to see the date. Now I've had an Amdeck 300A on the channel before, and I did a video a while back where I did a bunch of CRT swapping, and it was on the main channel, and one of them was a 300A. There's a sister monitor to this, the 310A, which looks physically identical to this, but it is monochrome, or I'm sorry, it is an MDA connector on it, nine pin, designed for use on an IBM PC with an MDA or Hercules adapter. This particular one is just regular composite video, so it would be used with an Apple II or any other monochrome video output type machine. Or I suppose if you wanted to use it with a Commodore 64 or VIC-20, you could as well. You would just get shades of amber. And yes, this is an amber screen. Now compared to my other 300A, uh, this one is in much better physical shape. The brown plastic here on the front is painted, so it's very easy to get scratched up. And I think my other one, it's got some little scratches and nicks on it. And the plastic underneath is this sort of beigey color plastic that uh, is actually quite yellowed on the rest of the monitor. But we'll take a look, look at that in a second. So this screen has what is called a mesh anti-glare filter. And you'll notice there is some reflection there because underneath this mesh filter here is a glossy glass CRT. It's not etched or anything like that. But it wasn't uncommon in the early 80s to try to fix the glare situation on monitors by either etching the glass or putting this mesh on it. And it's actually a cloth mesh, just like say pantyhose material or something. Now the problem is, is to clean this screen, you have to take the monitor completely apart, including taking the CRT out. And then you can take this mesh cloth off, which has a little frame around it. And then you can try to clean it and you can clean the CRT underneath. But since this is a mesh, dirt can easily pass right through it to the CRT behind it, and it can dim the picture quite a bit depending on how much dirt's on there. Not to mention, sometimes you get scuffs or something drips on the screen, and it's basically at that point impossible to clean without taking the monitor apart completely. So on all the other monitors I have with this mesh, including my Apple Monitor 3 and the other Amdeck 300As, I just removed this mesh entirely and actually threw it away. Now, since we've already seen this monitor before on the channel, I'll just do a super quick tour. It's got a pull on off power switch here with brightness and contrast. There is nothing at all on the sides except for what you see as pretty yellowed plastic, unfortunately. And strangely enough, the front of the screen is not that yellow. So you can see the plastic under there is looking okay, but the sides and the back are quite a bit yellowed. So I guess some retro bright could help that. It does have a carry handle on the top. On the back of the monitor, here's the power cord. It's just a two pin power cord. It has a little bit of a wire management thing here. There's a manufacturer date right here, it's January, 1985. There's the composite video input. Amdeck Corporation was a US company, but their monitors were always like OEM. They bought them from someone else. So it's quite possible there's another monitor that looks just like this floating around out there with the original equipment manufacturer branding on it. Well, it looks like this side of the monitor is not quite as yellowed as the other side. So the reason why I have this on the bench is because this monitor is not working. Now I had briefly tested this before and my little note says no picture and sounds off. And that doesn't mean that it has no sound like a speaker or whatever. It just means that the sound that the monitor is making doesn't sound right. So let's plug it into power and give it another test. It's plugged into mains and let's turn it on. But before I do, I'll just talk about the fact that it does have a power LED here. And I don't remember if I turned it on last time and I noticed that that was working or not. So let's see. Okay. So it turns on, but the sound the monitor is making just sounds weird. So I'm running the program called Spectroid here, which is a really good spectrum analyzer. And I turned on the monitor while I had this next to it. Hopefully that's coming across in the camera, but we should be seeing a peak there when the monitor's turned on around 15.7 kilohertz. And even that's even with no video connected to the monitor. It should have an internal oscillator that is set correctly, but it's actually running around 13.6 kilohertz, which indicates that there's definitely something going on with this monitor. I had plugged something into the input on the back and there wasn't any kind of picture whatsoever. So the first step to trying to fix this thing is, I gotta open it up. Okay, the back's off and the monitor's actually running and now it sounds normal. 
And take a look at that, 15.7 kilohertz. And notice there I was adjusting it. Well, there's a horizontal hold control right here. And maybe what was wrong is the picture wasn't working on this. And whoever had this monitor was just turning all the controls wildly. So the horizontal hold was way out of whack. So just for fun, let's uh, reconnect a video input to this thing here. And uh, I want to see if that makes a difference. I mean, I don't think so, but I didn't really give this thing much troubleshooting last time. All right, so yeah, we definitely have no image. And that is the brightness. And this contrast knob is really sticky. It does barely turns. But I don't really see any image whatsoever. And earlier I had said that the thing sounded off. Now that was just because it was running at that weird frequency. And now it's running at 15.7 kilohertz as reported by the app on my phone. I can barely hear the monitor. Now it's on right now and yet we have no image. So I'm gonna quickly check to see if there is any high voltage on this. The overall condition inside here is pretty good. It's pretty clean. I don't see a lot of filth or dust or anything in here. So let's just uh, get underneath here my high voltage probe. Come on. Oh yeah, we have high voltage getting about, um, I'd say we have about 14 kilovolts there. And according to the sticker right up here, 13.2 is what this thing should be running at. Now, unfortunately, I already know this because I've looked this up. Uh, there are no schematics for this monitor, no service manual, no schematics. So I'm gonna have to try to use some of my logic skills here to try to figure out What's wrong with this monitor? Now, from a troubleshooting perspective, I was 99.9999% sure we had good high voltage already because the monitor sounds like it's working normally. And that app on the phone really confirmed that the 15.7 kilohertz was there. And of course, that's the oscillator that's running here that is driving the flyback transformer that is generating the high voltage. If the phone was not picking up that 15.7 kilohertz or it was whatever, 13.7 at first, then there is definitely not gonna be any high voltage. Okay, so we have an oscillator that's running, we have high voltage. That implies, of course, that B plus is working. That is the voltage that's running the entire monitor. And that comes from right here, there's a transformer. And this will, of course, convert the mains down to whatever, like 12 volts or something like that, probably 14 volts. And there is a little voltage selection here, by the way, you can switch between 120 volts and uh, 220 volts right there. And then of course, there is going to be a voltage regulator in here, which is almost certainly gonna be like right here, this uh, large resistor right there. And there's another little transistor that's mounted on this large heat sink. Now the transformer in here tells us that this is an isolated design, which means it's not a hot chassis. And of course that, that makes sense because when you're hooking something up to a computer, that is almost certainly gonna be grounded with earth ground. That would mean that the ground on the video cable is actually earth ground. And you don't wanna possibly hook that up to a live ch chassis set because if this two prong plug were reversed or your wiring was wrong, then of course this could be live at mains uh, voltage, which of course would create a short circuit if you plugged it into your computer. The transformer results in an unregulated but lower AC voltage, like I said, around 14 volts, but it will be dependent on exactly whatever your mains voltage is. So you definitely need a voltage regulator. Now this large uh, resistor right here is almost certainly part of that regulation circuit that is creating that B plus on this board. And that's the regulated power supply that the monitor needs. Now, because this is a monochrome monitor, it's extra simple. There's just not a lot going on. That's why the, the circuit board here is just not that big. It's not that complicated. There are a few things that are required to make the monitor work. Now we have a working B plus, that's the main voltage the monitor works off. Of course, that's the most important thing that is required. Now, what else is required to make the monitor work? Well, you have to have horizontal deflection and you have to have vertical deflection. And of course you have to have something that drives the cathode. And you also have to have something that heats the filament in the CRT. Well, we know that the horizontal deflection is working right now because we have the 15.7 kilohertz. That is the horizontal deflection. And that is what is required to generate the high voltage, which we also know we have. So horizontal deflection circuit entirely works. We don't need to worry about that. We don't need to look at that or anything there. Vertical deflection, on the other hand, we don't know for sure if that's working. And if I listen, I don't necessarily hear it. But the thing is, vertical deflection has nothing to do with creating an image on the screen. Well, I mean, if vertical deflection weren't working, you'd just get a solid line across the screen that would be very bright if there were an image. So of course it's needed to have a good image, but vertical not working is not gonna affect 
the brightness or like the rest of the monitor. When the horizontal doesn't work, on the other hand, that's going to result in no high voltage. And when you have no high voltage, you can't possibly have an image on the CRT either. So the problem has to be either the filament. Well, the CRT itself can be dead, I guess. The filament may not be getting power to heat it up. Usually it runs on 12 volts on monitors like this. Or the cathode drive, that's what controls the cathode, which is what generates the electrons that go towards the front of the screen. There may be a problem in that circuit as well. And of course, the cathode is driven from the video signal. So the video signal comes in, the sync signals are removed from it, and they go to the various parts of the board to, to run the sync. And then that video information is then run through some transistors that eventually makes its way to the cathode in the CRT right here to actually generate the electrons. All right, so I decided to take the PCB out of the monitor because I wanted to troubleshoot the video input signal chain, so to speak. All right, so this is the RCA jack here. There's a little gray cable here that comes down right here to the PCB. This is the connection where the video signal comes in and it looks like it goes through a couple components right here, but I have a feeling it quickly goes right off the board and back to the front of the monitor for the contrast knob. I'm pretty sure the contrast knob just directly manipulates the video signal. Although it's probably happening after the sync signal is already removed. So it's probably what's happening initially when this comes onto the board. And I actually don't know for sure if the sync signals are even getting processed. So even though this monitor is unplugged and it's turned off right now, I'm gonna put the video signal into here from my test pattern generator, which is turned on. And let's fire up the uh, Handtech portable oscilloscope here. If you haven't seen my review of this little device, uh, it's on the main channel. I'll put a link in the description. I was pleasantly surprised at how well this thing actually worked. And one thing that's good about it when working on a monitor, for instance, is that it is completely isolated since it's battery powered. Okay, so the very first thing I need to do is I'm using the multimeter here, continuity mode. I just wanna see where ground on the video input is going on this connector here. Okay, it's these two pins over on the left side. Okay, I just have the scope set up here. I'm just testing it right off the connector. That's the normal stair step I expect to see. So now I can sort of probe around on here and just make sure that I am actually getting that signal where I expect it. All right, so there's the signal. So let's see, there's a capacitor there. And then that goes over here to these uh, resistors here. So the capacitor is not open because if it were, we wouldn't be seeing a signal there. And I'm just checking on the other side of these resistors here. That one's not getting anything, but that one is but I can see this one resistor here is going to a, the base of a transistor. And there is a signal right there. Now, obviously, since the monitor's off, I'm not gonna be getting uh, anything on the emitter or the collector. I don't know if it's a PMP or NPN transistor here, but that transistor might have failed, for instance, and that would cause the video signal to not work. Looks like these other resistors and things are like a Zener diode as well, all just go to ground. So the most important thing, obviously, is this transistor right here. So I'm gonna to have to power up the monitor to really do any further testing to see if that thing is working. All right, well, it looks like to plug this back in because I have it sort of disconnected, I'm gonna to have to get this transformer out as well. So the transformer assembly is on this metal bracket that's held in by four screws and there's actual like hot glue in there. So I'm gonna to have to get that out to get these screws out uh, so I can get this uh, transformer out of here so I can work on this thing. There we go. How weird, little plugs. I guess they didn't want anyone accidentally taking these screws out and then forgetting them and having that transformer sort of floating around inside. Or maybe they had problems where like these screws back themselves out during transport or shipping or something. And then uh, people called to complain that, you know, they had a giant heavy transformer floating around inside their monitor, smashing everything up. Now there's one possibility while I take these screws out. Um, could be that the entire video circuitry is working and the problem is the CRT is just dead. So, you know, it's, it's hard to know. CRTs can fail internally, right? It's, uh, it's not a given that they always work. They could have shorts and who knows whatever's wrong. So I could hook up the CRT tester to the CRT. Oops, I almost dropped that screw. I could hook up the tester. That'd be a way to know. I could also hook the oscilloscope potentially up to the cathode drive pin, whatever that is on the CRT here, with the monitor running. Okay, see, this is all coming out now. I think actually with this transformer sort of slid out, I can now operate this uh, with this board, maybe like this, maybe. Let me see if I figure out how to do this. 
All right, I think this is gonna work here. The only thing I'm gonna do is I have the little cap on the back of the CRT and it's got some exposed terminals and it's sort of close to some heat sinks and stuff. So I'm just gonna cut off some electrical tape and cover those up. That way uh, there's no exposed little terminals that can come, come in contact with one of those heat sinks. There we go, just better safe than sorry. Okay, so everything is connected again. Let's see, is it all indeed connected? Yes, it is. So I think the monitor is ready to be turned back on in this very precarious state. And then just so I can see the front of the screen, I have a mirror here. So I'm gonna stick this over here. So now I can just glance over there and see the monitor if there is indeed video being displayed. And there's the oscilloscope, and let's pull the power switch, turn this thing on. Okay, definitely felt the high voltage on the front of the CRT, a little bit of static. And are we getting anything on the picture tube? We are not, okay. Okay, so let's look for the video signal. So there's on the other side of that capacitor. Here is the base on that transistor. There we go, we have it there. It's definitely no video signal on the, on the screen though. Uh, let's check the emitter, which is labeled. Okay, there's definitely video there, so we know that's good. Uh, I know it's going to be really hard to see, but it comes out of the emitter and it goes to another capacitor. And there it is. We have a video signal still. Uh, it goes through a resistor right here. Uh, there it is. It looks good still. Looks like it goes to another transistor. So there it is, base, and it looks good. And let's check the emitter. Uh, not seeing anything there. Maybe it's on the collector. Okay. Yep. There's a large waveform there. So that's probably like some kind of a uh, horizontal sink pulse, I'm assuming. Which comes out there. Yep. So I see it all over the place. So that's the pulse. Okay. All right. And it looks like this, and then the signal seems to split off. It also goes down here. Is this uh, to ground? Yep. I think it is. So there it is. And there's another transistor here, and there's the base. And let's see, the collector and emitter. So there's the video signal. Comes out down here to this capacitor. I think that's to ground. Yep. And this whole section of the board we're in here is like the brightness control. So the brightness and contrast knobs come uh, from this section here into the front. And that's going to manipulate the video signal. So I'm just gonna probe on these pins here and see if we see any video signal activity on these pins. So far, nothing there. All right, so there's some video signal activity right there on this wire on the top. All right, so I'm hooked on here and I'm gonna try to reach over here and adjust these knobs here and see if there's any change. Okay, that one does is affected by the bottom uh, contrast knob. So that's telling me that um, Definitely this, this knob on the front is working. So it comes in this B5 pin here, makes its way, what is it, are we here? There we are. Jumps over this capacitor, which is okay, it's not open or whatever. And it looks like it makes its way over to this part of the board. There's a couple resistors, another capacitor. I see the video signal there. We have another transistor right here. And let's check the emitter on that one. Okay, we have a video signal. It's, you know, it looks a little bit different, but it's still there. And there's a couple diodes here. There it is. We see the video signal there and there. Yeah, that's obviously adding in some pulses or something. Okay, goes to here. There's the video signal still. There's a resistor, there it is. The resistor. All right, so so far everything looks good. I mean, I'm I'm not. I don't think I'm all the way through the circuit, but I'm I'm nearly there, and yet everything is good. Uh, I'm gonna pull the plug out of the wall here for a sec. So I'm just trying to look here to see which is the cathode drive. I have a feeling it's this yellow wire right here, which I know you can't really see, and it goes down to the bottom of the board down here where it says K2. So I'm just gonna change this to like five volts per division and this is a 10X probe, so that's for 50 volts. And I'm gonna check that K2 pin there. So I gotta plug the power back in, of course. Okay, the monitor is on. So there's K2. I'm not really seeing much. 
All right, and switching this down to 200 millivolts, and I mean, that looks like the video signal right there on K2. Now watch, I'm gonna change the uh, test pattern, something else. So you look at that, it's definitely, it's, it's, that is what I'm, I'm sending to the, to the screen. So I'm gonna pull out the power cord again, and I'm gonna put this board back down here again. I just wanna make sure that uh, if I peel this tape off here, that I really have that signal available on this yellow wire right here. All right, so I'm clipped right onto the pin there. That it should be the cathode drive. And I just plugged the monitor back in and we're not really seeing much on here, but it's because I set this back to five volts. And sure enough, there it is. There's the video signal right there. Okay, so we know the cathode drive is there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct. Okay, so I just switched this back to 10 volts per vision. I'm gonna change this from AC coupling to DC coupling. Let's take a look at what voltage we're actually seeing on this line here. Wow, it's right off the top. All right, so at 20 volts per division, 20, 40, 60, it's like up at 60 volts. And I'm pretty sure that the cathode drive needs to be down by ground for it to actually work properly. All right, one thing I haven't done is check to make sure that the heater is actually working on here. So these are the heater pins right here. I'm just gonna make sure that we actually have like 12 volts or so. Yeah, 11.9, so that's fine. And with the power removed and the socket disconnected, I'm just gonna check the resistance of those pins. Which one is it? It's these two here. Okay, yeah, 75 ohms, it's, it's falling a little bit, which is normal because as it heats up, uh, the res resistance goes up. Okay, so that implies that the heater is running and I, it does feel a little bit warm, so that, that makes sense. So we have a heater that works, we have high voltage, we have what looks like cathode drive, although I'm not totally right sure the voltages are right, it's like up at 60 volts or so. We know we have deflection, at least horizontal deflection. I guess what I'm gonna do next is, I think I'm gonna desolder this yellow wire from this connector. Plug this back on, turn the monitor back on, and then I'm gonna ground the cathode. As the cathode potential gets closer to ground, and the electronics would be normally doing that, it actually turns on the beam. So we're seeing up around 60 volts right now. Maybe the beam is just not getting turned on. So if I ground it manually, which by disconnecting this uh, yellow wire here, then that should just make the entire picture amber, you know, white. And you see this little thing right here? That's just a spark gap, which is like a little safety device. Basically, it goes to ground essentially. So I'm just gonna pull this yellow wire off. Come on off. Oh, it's very, very well attached. There we go. Okay, so there's the cathode drive disconnected. Okay, for testing, I grabbed a potentiometer. I hooked uh, one side of it up to the cathode yellow wire here that goes to the motherboard. So that's at the 60 volts or so. I hooked the other side up here to the ground lead that's right here on the, the connector. And then the middle one, goes to the actual pin that is the cathode. That's where the yellow wire was connected. Now I already checked with the multimeter. I turned it all the way to the 60 volt side. So it's fully on the uh, cathode side. So I'll show the screen and we'll turn on the monitor. And as I turn this, it should bring the cathode down towards ground and then that should start to light up. Okay, monitor should be on. Yes, it is. Now when I turn this potentiometer, if I don't see anything on there, that means that maybe there's something wrong with the, uh, the grid voltages on the CRT here. Turn this pot here, come on. There we go. Okay, I am fully grounding the cathode now and we don't see anything at all. That is interesting. And just for test testing, I'm gonna grab the multimeter here and I'm just gonna check to see that that is definitely the case. So we'll go to voltage. I am touching the ground up on the top here and let's see what the cathode is. Yeah, it's down at zero volts. Huh. Okay, let's turn this the other way just to make sure that I'm really getting the, the 60 volts or whatever I expect on the cathode there. Yeah, 54.6 volts, okay. So when I ground the cathode, I don't get an image. Let's check out what other voltages we're getting here on the CRT. So, uh, okay, so we know the heater is working, right? There's the heater, 11.9. Uh, let's see what pin this is, I don't know. 529 volts. 
So that's like one of the, the grids, probably like G1 or something. I think this purple wire should be like the focus voltage. What are we getting on that? 157. All right, so this green wire here, which I think is the brightness control is at negative 63 volts. And as I turn it, it gets closer to ground. Yep, minus 10 volts. I'm pretty sure there's a sub brightness control right there, which would also manipulate that. There, I just clipped it on just for ease of, uh, of visibility. Okay, so uh, let's say I'm turning this all the way up right now. So it gets closer to ground, which I think makes sense. Not 100% familiar. I'm gonna adjust the sub brightness control, which is right here. Let me fiddle with the sub brightness control. Okay, so it's going more negative now. And if I turn this all the way up, it is now at positive nine volts. I'm pretty sure the further away from zero, like the more negative that this uh, screen control is, the, the darker the picture is. So a sub brightness like turned way down, we're at negative 43 volts. And the place I could see where it was set originally, it was kind of around there, um, around this minus 10. And that is with the brightness knob almost all the way up. This is very mysterious here. I, I say everything should be working and yet it's obviously not working. So I think at this point, I need to get out the CRT tester. Incidentally, I feel that this is a little bit warm. So obviously I was putting quite a lot of uh, load through that pot there. Good thing it's a good quality one. All right, I have the tester hooked up and I mean, there's actually emissions on here. It's not totally dead. So we should be seeing an image. So I must have something wrong with what we're seeing um, on the CRT there. Cause uh, this does climb. I mean, it's not great. But I, I don't know, you know, who knows what this is like when it's new, but there's definitely some emissions on here. So we should be seeing something. There's no reason we're seeing nothing at all. Well, I mean, other than there's something wrong with the monitor. I mean, there's, there is that. The CRT appears to have no cutoff. And incidentally, there's a way to check for shorts as well on here. And um, yeah, there is no shorts. It would show up right here on the little lights. All right, well, back to troubleshooting on the monitor, I guess. Well, I've been racking my brain trying to figure out what might be wrong here, and I just don't have an idea. I was looking at some schematics for a different monitor, another monochrome monitor, just to make sure that those voltages I was seeing on here are correct. And indeed, like this is a SAMS from my, I don't know what monitor it is, but it says on the cathode, you should be seeing around 42 volts, and that's, we're seeing around 60. It says for G1, which is the brightness control, you should be seeing around minus 11 volts. Remember, uh, the G1 is when we turn the brightness knob. That's what we see. We see between minus 10 and minus 60 volts. And then it says for G2, which is typically called screen control, we're seeing 500 or something volts on here. And it says for something on there. And then for focus, I was seeing 100 and something on here. And that monitor has 270. It's it's all very similar. That's a monochrome monitor with the same pinout as this. So this thing should be generating an image and it's not. So I really think there's just some kind of a problem with the CRT. And I know we saw emissions on the tester, but it doesn't really make sense to me. So I'm gonna grab another CRT. It's a nine inch one and this is a 12 inch one. Let's try that out. 13 and a half thousand volts that this thing is generating for the high voltage is a little bit high for a nine inch, but I think it should be fine just for a quick test. All right, I grabbed my test CRT out of uh, an old Macintosh. This is the one I rejuvenated a long time ago and it's very dim. So I just use it for testing. Transferred the yoke over, I connected the CRT, high voltage is connected and a couple ground leads go from the implosion band here onto the, the ground on that monitor. Let's just make sure everything is okay to turn on here. Uh, I did reconnect the cathode wire, by the way. I put it back where it originally was. On the front controls here, I turned the uh, brightness and the contrast all the way down. That way, uh, you know, I don't know how this thing is gonna react. And I have mains connected. It's off right now, just one more sanity check. Okay, these ground leads are connected to there, which is good. Deflection yoke is on, that is on. I think, um, I think we're ready to go for testing here. All right, there we go. Okay, I don't expect to see anything yet because of course I have brightness to contrast all the way down. Okay, look at that. With the brightness turned all the way up. We, we do have some raster going on there. Although um, 
interesting is there is definitely no image. Let's fiddle with the sub brightness control here. Okay, so yeah, we have raster, but we are definitely not getting a video signal. So the image is definitely rolling. I need to kind of get my hand under here a little bit to adjust the, uh, I'm just turning the vertical hold control. Okay. Seems like it's locked on there. And this is the, all right, this is the horizontal hold and it definitely appears like it's locking on. Uh, the raster I'm seeing is pretty sharp, so that's not an issue. But we definitely don't seem to have a video signal. Let me unplug the, the connector here. Okay, so it is locking onto the sink. See how the, the changes dramatically when it's unplugged? And there it is connected back up. Hmm. I am surprised that there is a raster here and there wasn't on the other one. So that's weird. But that just could be because that monitor is so worn out that this board just can't drive it bright enough to show a raster. But there definitely seems to be a problem with the amplification in the cathode drive circuit. So I got to get back to that now. Okay, so I have some schematics up on the monitor. They're not for the AM deck, of course, because I, like I said, there are no schematics for this. These are the SAMS schematics for the Apple IIc monitor, one of the two versions. And the reason why I'm looking at this is I wanted to see the cathode drive circuit on the Apple IIc, which I figure it's going to be similar-ish to this monitor. Specifically, I wanted to look at what this output is right here. So what's happening here is... This is the cathode drive right here. This is what goes to the CRT. And it says that it should be about 25 volts peak to peak, and you should be seeing the video signal. And I know you can't really see that very well on the camera, but that's what it's showing right here. On this side here, it's showing the video signal only about 2.3 volts peak to peak. And it's, of course, it's inverted because the CRT requires the video signal to be inverted because as you get towards ground, that lights up the actual phosphor. Now, I think this is a very similar design to what's on the actual AM deck. And the reason why is this is the output transistor that goes to the cathode, and it's the collector here that's heading towards the cathode. And there is a 470 ohm resistor here and an inductor. And then right here is a two watt resistor, and it happens to be 820 ohms. And on the monitor down here, it's actually a somewhat similar situation, although not exactly the same. This is what's happening on this monitor. So Q104 is the output transistor that drives the cathode uh, out of the collector, which is just like on the schematics there. Uh, it comes out and it goes through a 100 ohm resistor to the cathode itself. And on the Apple IIc schematics there, it's a 470 ohm resistor. Then it's going over here to what is one of the boost voltages, or it's about um, 60 volts on this monitor. That's what's over on this side. I didn't draw it, but uh, that's what it is. There's a two watt resistor that's 12K. There's an inductor. And it also has this diode that's bypassing this, and it goes between the collector here and the uh, boost voltage. It's pretty similar on here, although there's no diode, so there's the inductor. It has an 820 ohm resistor, 2 watts, and the AMDEC, of course, has a 14 or a 12K or whatever it is at 2 watts. Now, the video is connected to the monitor and is powered up. And if I go onto the board here and we check the output of the collector, which is what that is, uh, we are getting about 57 volts. And notice the lines up at the top here, there's just no video signal. Like we don't see the 25 volts peak to peak that we should be seeing as on at least that schematic. And I know it's not the same exact monitor, but the CRT on an Apple IIc is very similar to this one. So the, what's the cathode is getting for a drive signature should be basically the same. So that's telling us right there that there's a problem. Now, from my understanding, this two transistor design here for the output is very classic, and that's what the 2C is using. It's actually what this monitor is using as well. Now, there are two transistors on this monitor that make up the cathode drive. There's 103 and 104, and the video signal is visible going into 103, but then you don't really see it between them. But I asked my friend Frank, IZ8DWF, about this little setup here. He says it's a very classic design for CRTs, on monochrome CRTs at least. Typically when you're probing this with the oscilloscope, you will not see the waveform on the connections that are between these two transistors because the collector of this one goes into the emitter of this other transistor. And that's because I think the relationship of these two together is based on current and not voltage. And of course, without something dropping voltage like a resistor in there, you can't really measure this with a normal oscilloscope. So he assures me that the fact that I don't see the video waveform going into Q104, which is that final output transistor, that that is normal. Frank thinks that the fact that we're not seeing that output waveform on the cathode itself, which is this pin I have the probe on, 
It's probably something to do with something that is on the collector side of the final output transistor. And the cathode is also connected to the collector. And that's what I have drawn on this piece of paper. So the collector comes out, it goes through a resistor to the cathode, which is this resistor right here, which on the multimeter should show up as, yep, 104 ohms. So that one is good. And then there's a diode here and an inductor, and it goes over uh, to this resistor right here. So there's the inductor, that L102, and here is the resistor. Now, when I measure this, I get 34 ohms. And I looked at that resistor and it's 12K. Now, if I reverse the leads around, now remember there's that diode uh, in parallel and that diode is right there. If I reverse the leads, then if that diode was working properly, we wouldn't see anything. We'd see 12K one direction. And look, we are getting, it just fell off. We're getting 33.8 ohms the other way. So we're getting, uh, basically not quite a short, but very low resistance, both directions on this 12K resistor. So there are two possibilities here. One possibility is that resistor, which is a 12K, has gone from being 12,000 ohms to uh, 38 ohms. That's pretty much impossible. Like they can go open, like they can blow open. It is a two watt resistor, so it's very chunky. Um, or the other thing is this diode right here, D101, has shorted, or at least it's gone very low resistance. So what I need to do is pull out that diode and uh, let's take a look at that out of circuit. So I know you can't really see what I'm doing here because uh, it's on the wrong side and the wires are too short, but upon trying to pull this diode out, uh, there's a lot of brown gunk on here. Now we've had brown gunk on the channel before. Okay, the diode uh, came out and actually totally broke. So there it is, there is just part of it. Now that has me worried <laughs> because I am now all of a sudden thinking that the issue might be the brown gunk causing corrosion. Oh boy. <laughs> now you see this capacitor here, 270? Looks like it's actually falling apart. Well, they stuck some brown gunk on the board right here um, and I'm pretty sure that brown gunk has caused that diode to fail. And to be honest, that cap looks like it's failing as well because of the brown gunk. Now I'm trying to pull the lead out for that, that diode. There it is. And the diode is not supposed to come apart that way. So I'm gonna scrape off as much of this gunk as I can. Doesn't really seem to be on this board very much except for right in this one spot. Indeed, this 270K, whatever this is, don't know if this is a capacitor or what, has a big crack in the side, right where the gunk is. All right, I don't, I don't think that was actually in focus. So this is an inductor, 270K there. I'm just gonna measure that. So it's this one right here, L204. Yeah, 31.9 microhenries. So 270K, so this is actually 320K. I think that's um, good. So it hasn't totally died. <laughs> But that is definitely problematic right there. And look at this diode. Definite corrosion going on here. Oh yeah, that brown gunk did its, uh, did its thing on it. So I'm looking at the part number here. It's 1N4. Oh, actually, I think this is actually a Zener diode. So that's problematic. Uh, I wonder what voltage. So it's available from 3.3 to 75. That's a one and four. Ooh, okay. I don't know if I, I'm gonna be able to figure this out. Is this diode definitely shorted? Yep, 37 ohms. So that diode is dead. That's exactly what we were seeing on there. And unfortunately, other than one and four, no markings on there. So I have no way to know what voltage this, what this Zener was. Now I have a little assortment of Zeners, like here's a 30 volt one. I have some more from DigiKey here, 18 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts. I'm kind of like, I don't know, I'm just gonna put in the highest one I can find. 33 volts, 5.6. Why don't we put the 33 in? I mean, I don't know what's gonna happen. The monitor doesn't work anyways. Now, unfortunately, I don't really fully understand what this diode is doing here. 
So that means that, you know, I'm not really sure from an engineering perspective what voltage Zener this, this needs to be. I think this is something to do with the, the, the turnoff of the monitor, like the, the spot. Remember all that spot fixing stuff I did previously on the, the Commodore PET? I think it's related to this. All right, so I've soldered that diode on. And just, I think, for testing purposes, I'm going to not cut these leads off in case this is the wrong value and I need to take it out. <laughs> okay, ready for testing. The monitor is still off. I do not have the connector on the CRT. High voltage is hooked up, but the connector isn't. So even if this is working now, we're not going to get any image on the CRT. I just want to see if the output transistor now has that correct swing of the image that we should be seeing, like the actual... Um, video that's going into this should be visible on here. All right, monitor is powered up. And unfortunately, we can see that I'm still not getting the image. We're only getting uh, 58 volts now with no picture. That did not fix the problem, even though for sure that diode was bad. Okay, and I just realized something. I installed that diode backwards. <laughs> so... I might have just killed that diode. <laughs> I can't believe it. I was like looking at, there's a picture right on the board here on both sides. And I was, I need to make sure I put that on the right way. I put it on the wrong way. Oh boy. Okay, monitor is off again. Let's heat up the uh, iron here so I can get this off. All right, out with the diode. Look at some of that brown crap got on here. Wow. All right, I just used my bench power supply to test this Zener and it still seems to be working and it starts to conduct around 33 volts. Oh, and you know what, before I resolder this in, let's just quickly check to see if that resistor is actually 12K as it says it's supposed to be. Oh, it's actually 1.2K, which um, I think I just read it wrong. It's a bit hard to see. One, yep, 1.2K, two watts, okay. That is correct. Okay, so the diode, the band should be towards the right. And that is how it is actually installed this time. Okay, it is now in again. So back to the oscilloscope. And luckily I can just clip right on to one of the legs of the diode there. And let's plug this in. Oh, look at that, everyone. That is exactly what we expected to see. Cool. So that's the cathode drive actually working. So the problem was before is it was being shorted by that bad diode. And then of course when I had this in backwards, it was the equivalent of shorting it as well. Luckily that was a beefy enough diode. I didn't run it that long. I guess it didn't really cause an issue. So at this point, it's now time to connect the CRT back up again. And let's see if we have any kind of image on there. And look, when I pull the power cord out, that voltage drops pretty slowly from 60 volts. Takes its sweet, sweet time to get all the way down. I'll just wait a moment till it zeroes out. I still don't have high hopes that this CRT actually works because I never saw any raster on it, even when I had all the brightnesses cranked all the way up. But let's give it a try. All right, there we go. It's in. And I do have the oscilloscope connected and I do see a signal. Let's wait for the CRT to warm up. Are you going to, oh, look, there's a crosshatch. There is a crosshatch, ladies and gentlemen. Let's check these controls on the front here. So this is the contrast one, and this one is the brightness. And yeah, brightness is up all the way. And that is dim. And there's a color bars, and uh, yeah, so this is one one very tired CRT. Let me try turning the sub-brightness control. Okay, I'm on the sub-brightness control here. Okay, actually, you know what, to be honest, uh, there is raster there now. When I turn this all the way up, it certainly blooms a lot there. You see how, how big the picture gets when I turn it up? And that's because we're maxing out the uh, entire power supply section. Well, I'm not surprised that this looks really dim. And that, of course, is because on the tester when I hooked it up, the emissions were very low. So I knew this CRT wasn't going to look good. I suppose I could try to hit it with the rejuvenator. I mean, it looks like crap, so it can't hurt. Now, the question I have is when I pull the power cord with that 33-volt Zener in there, what's this going to do? Are we going to see a flash? Are we going to see a dot? 
Well, nothing. It just sort of blanks out altogether. So we have a working monitor that we have an actual waveform on the scope there. So the cathode drive is absolutely working now and it seems to turn off without any kind of issue. So why don't I cr crop those leads? Let's just get rid of these here. And I think from a longevity perspective, I'm just gonna hit this with some uh, IPA here and just try to scrape away as much of that brown gunk as I can. Keep this monitor working longer since uh, eventually it's going to eat away at this inductor that's right here. I understand why they did this. Oh, more of this inductor's flaking off. I get why they did this. They just wanted to make sure that this stuff doesn't break during transport. That's why they put this brown gunk on here. It just has the horrible side effect of becoming conductive, corrosive, and everything in between and causing damage. And that's just like on that IBM monitor. Now I'm just giving a quick look here just to see if there is any more of that gunk anywhere else. It doesn't appear they use the brown gunk on any other part of this monitor. Like the electrolytics don't have it. I don't see it anywhere else. That's it. And I think what I'm going to do next, because this thing is so dim, I'm going to pop the CRT out. I will remove that mesh cover from the front so I can give it a good clean. And then I'm going to try to rejuvenate the CRT to try to bring it up to brightness a little bit. And actually with that mesh off of it, I might be able to see if there's any burn in on this screen as well. Okay, CRT is pulled back. And here's that mesh on the inside here. There it is. It's actually not looking, it's actually not looking too dirty at all. All right, it is back in. Now I can just slide these back in. Uh, a little bit more work needs to be done. I really need to remove those front controls and uh, do some cleaning on them because one is very sticky. But I just wanted to see how this looks, uh, at least mostly back together and working. All right, there it is without the uh, front cloth on there. So let's just get this with a little, ooh yeah. It's a bit of dirt, but you know what? To be honest, not nearly as bad as some of these other ones I've seen where it was just completely filthy underneath there. There we go, 100% field. Yep, so there's a little bit of burn-in. I could see there and there, like the image was in the middle there. So a very well used, actually it's there too. So I can see exactly where this monitor spent most of its life. And I can definitely tell you one thing, down here in this low brightness area, it's really, really sharp and nice. But of course, because the CRT is very tired, when I really crank it all the way up, well, now like these lines aren't sharp anymore because it's just being overdriven. So. Just another case of a monitor that was used and used and used, which means that whoever bought this thing originally got their money's worth out of it, which is nice because you know, you'd hope that they didn't buy something and it just didn't, you know, wasn't used at all. So that's cool. But for us now, that means that this thing is usable, but dim and just not that great. All right, this is hooked up again. So uh, let's just go through this again. There doesn't really appear to be any cutoff. So there's some emissions still. So let's go to cut off. And I mean, the needle just barely moves. It's really supposed to go to this first line here and it doesn't do that. So when we go to emissions tests, I mean, with this cutoff turned all the way up, it's there, but it's dropping. So let's just let it sit there for a second. Just wanna see what it drops to. It's interesting, it's actually reading better than it was before. So I mean, the fact that I guess I ran the monitor a little bit sort of woke it up, so to speak, but it's still really dim. So we're gonna do some, we're gonna do some rejuvenation. So we're gonna go over here. We're gonna start at 25 milliamps and I've set the camera up here, manual focus. I'm gonna film this while I do the rejuvenation. All right, there it is. Now it looks like you see a red uh, filament there. That's actually the camera tally light. See, I'm covering the front on my camera with it. So ignore that. So we're gonna go back to restorer. We're gonna do 25 milliamps. Here we go. Watch for sparks. Look at that, light show. Neat, right? <laughs> I don't know what it's doing exactly. It's like blowing the, the junk off there or something. <laughs> doing something. But it kind of heats up the filament and does it when it's hot, does it when it's cold, shoots voltage into it, does stuff. I guess, 
Uh, it's clicking, doing things. I've seen little sparks still. On this particular CRT tester, it's just, it's a little program, like it runs through automation. Look, more sparks, do you see that? Neat. Well, it should be done in a second. Then I'll let it cool down and then I'll test the emissions. Okay, so upon testing the emissions, it's lower than it was. The cutoff is even worse than it was. So this was not a success. So I'm just gonna do it again. I don't know what else to do at this point because the CRT is already pretty dim and blurry. So I'm back on restore. I'm still on 25 milliamps and here we go again. Oh, after two rejuvenations at 25 milliamps, um, it's definitely lower than it was. It was kind of up around the middle here. It's a bit lower and cutoff is even worse. It basically doesn't move at all. So this CRT is just, it's shot. I guess what I can do is uh, I'll take the tester off and um, let's hook up the actual CRT electronics back to it. I am predicting that it all looks a lot worse than it did even before, which is just par for the course. Like I said, this monitor, it's just spent. It had its life, it was used up, and um, that's it, that's how it goes. These are consumable items. It's gonna look worse, I am sure of that. Rejuvenation is very hit and miss, and I found that a lot of times when I do it, it just, uh, comes out a lot worse. And um, that's this is one of those times. And there is the image. Brightness, contrast, all the way up. That's it. That's what we got now. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's a repair of an Amdeck 300A monitor. Repair, as so to speak. What do we learn here? Well, a couple things. The brown gunk on the motherboard used for stabilizing components, once again, destroys things. And definitely the problem on this monitor, well, there were two things, but the main problem was that that diode on the output circuit or the cathode drive there uh, had gone short and that was causing it not to work. This is for modulation of the, the signal here and that was no good. But uh, a couple other issues was that this CRT is just super duper worn out. And then I tried to rejuvenate it with the CRT rejuvenator and it made it far, far worse. I think the best thing we got out of the rejuvenation was a little bit of a light show on the back there. I hope that came out in the camera footage there, but uh, that was uh, the end of this CRT. It's, it's completely 100% unusable now. As I said, I don't feel that bad. It's really hard to tell in the camera when it was working better than this, how bright the image was or not bright. Because the camera does the auto compensation and all that stuff with the processing, it was very dim. Like it, this room, the lighting in here is not super bright. And to get it to a readable, usable text, I had to have everything at max and the text wasn't sharp anymore. And that is caused simply because this CRT is just spent. It no longer has good enough emissions to produce a usable image. And that is just what happens when CRTs get used up. Now, lucky for me, as I said at the beginning of this video, I have another Amdeck 300A that I think is an amalgamation of like a CRT from somewhere else and whatever. And it works pretty good, but it's in rough physical shape, like there's scratches all over the front. So I'm gonna definitely keep the rest of this monitor. I'm gonna e-waste this CRT though, keep the rest of it. And then I'm gonna swap the CRT from that other one into this one, which should make one really nice Amdeck 300A. When it comes to rejuvenation on this thing, I gotta say, I, I'm not gonna use it anymore. I don't think I've had any success with this thing. Every single time I've rejuvenated with this, it results in a picture tube that's worse than before I started. I had a, an older tester, uh, you might've seen on some of my older videos, and one time with that, I actually got decent results out of rejuvenation, and that's the CRT actually that I had out earlier, the nine inch one for testing. That one was really, really dim and it, it was better after rejuvenation with the old tester. But with that old tester on other CRTs and then this one with every single thing I've tried, it's always worse after the fact. Now I know there are lots of different testers and maybe some rejuvenate better than others. 
I couldn't tell you really, but um, I just, I need to stop using this one because it, it really makes things worse every, every single time. That's going to be it for this video on repairing CRT AMDEC. Um, if you have a CRT that's not working, look for the brown gunk and then check all the components around there. If I had just sort of gone over the board initially looking for shorted semiconductors, so diodes or transistors, I would have found this problem. Like that, that, you know, even without doing any other troubleshooting, just looking for shorted components would have found this problem. Other common issues with CRTs is that resistors can go open. So you might have like a 1K resistor, and when you measure it with your multimeter, it's like three mega ohm. I've had that happen on monitors too. That causes issues. And then of course, on the IBM, uh, there was that cap that had gone short. And I can't remember if there was brown gunk involved with that. I think there was. I think there was brown gunk glue, that is, for that monitor, which also caused that issue. I, I can't remember if that, I know the capacitor was shorted. I don't remember if the gunk caused it. But anyways, look for those types of things. To be honest, um, my bad is when I started working on this, I didn't look for those types of issues. I just started troubleshooting and using logic and whatever, but I could have just looked for the brown gunk. That would have led me right to the problem. <laughs> you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, so they say. So anyways, that is it. If you like this video, a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Um, thanks to my patrons. The names are scrolling on the side of the screen. You can, become a, you can become a patron as well if you want. Early access videos, all that good stuff. And um, yeah, that's it. So, um, oh yeah, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That would really make my day. So that's it. Stay healthy, stay safe. And I will see you next time. Bye.